Hi everyone, welcome to this M2D2 talk. Our speaker today is Ilya Igashov. Ilya is a PhD student at the Laboratory of Protein Design and Immunoengineering at EPFL. Advised by Bruno Correa and Michael Bronstein, he is a fellow at EPFL Global Leadership Program. His research interest lies in geometry deep learning for biology and chemistry and especially in application to protein-protein interaction and drug discovery. Prior to his PhD, Ilya did a re did research internship at INRIA and the University of Grenoble Arts, where he worked on graph neural network for protein model quality assessment. Thank you so much, Ilya, for accepting our invitation today and uh, looking forward to the talk. Hi, everyone. Thanks a lot, Prudencio, for introducing me. Uh, I'm very glad to be presenting here today. Um, and I'm going to tell you about our very recent work that we've done in our lab of protein design and immune engineering, uh, which is on uh, diffusion models for uh, designing molecular linkers for small molecules. Um, however, for the sake of um, consistency and also for giving you uh, full context and motivation, I will start with proteins. So proteins are uh, large biomolecules that play a crucial role um, in almost all living organisms. Uh, and they consist of amino acids that are connected together in uh, peptide chains. And once these chains are expressed in the cell, uh, they start immediately folding in a 3D structure that corresponds to the minimum of energy of this uh, chain and defines the function of the protein. So there are many different functions that proteins can perform in the cell, but essentially all of them are mediated by um, interactions between proteins and other molecules in a cell. And it's very interesting because then it means that if we are able to design and introduce new molecules in the cell that would bind and interact with uh, our protein of interest, we would be able to alter the function of this protein and, for example, treat some diseases. So this is like the basic idea uh, behind the drug design. When we have a protein that interacts with some substrate, which is shown here in the blue color, uh, we can try to design a new molecule that would bind to this active site of the protein and, for example, inhibit it, it initial activity with the substrate. Uh, so this is like one of examples. And of course, there are many different strategies how we could try to find the molecule that would bind to our target protein and maybe alter its function. But we can also ask ourselves a bit, maybe a broader question. How can we alter the function of the protein itself? Um, yeah, so basically there are, of course, many different uh, strategies of drug design, but here I will discuss uh, several main approaches where the starting points are already existing smaller chemical compounds that are, create, uh, that are defined and uh, combined together in order to create new chemical matter. And the first strategy is quite broad, though it's a fragment-based drug design, which is probably an umbrella term for a various of methods that operate on smaller building blocks, molecular building blocks, such as fragments, as shown here. And basically the idea is that first, given our target protein, we can try to define and maybe pre-dock some small molecular fragments that are usually don't exceed like 300 uh, Daltons in mass. Um, so we can dock them to our protein and then we can try to enrich this molecular system with additional atoms or maybe some modifications of the existing atoms in order to create chemically relevant binder to our target protein. There are several strategies in fragment-based drug design, how we can um, transform our initial set of fragments into some uh, connected molecule. Uh, for example, we can try to add new functional groups or other side chains to the, you know, the core part, which is fragment, and this is molecular growing. Or we can, if we have several fragments, we can try to connect them either merging on uh, common atoms or yeah, also introducing some modifications in these fragments or even introducing new atoms that constitute linkers that would further connect these fragments together. Uh, besides, we can also um, consider some known molecule that interacts with our protein of interest and try to modify some parts of this molecule in order to improve for example, binding affinity or uh, selectivity or even some pharmacokinetic properties of this molecule. 
Um, and very common strategy, which is called scaffold hopping, uh, is based on this idea. So basically, if we have some molecule and we can take its core part um, and try to modify it. In this example, there are very minor modifications that are introduced in a middle ring in this molecule that yeah, basically uh, lead to new properties of this molecule. But in principle, we can just remove um, this middle part of the molecule and try to design a thing that would connect uh, the remain, uh, remaining parts again. And finally, uh, uh, there is also another way how we could um, try to, for example, uh, 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 try to uh, prevent the protein from functioning as it usually functions in the cell uh, is to leverage the uh, ubiquitin proteasome system that exists in eukaryotic cells and which is responsible for protein degradation. So uh, the most common um, uh, the most common approaches that are used for using this uh, ubiquitin proteasome degradation is um, uh, designing products or molecular glues. So if we're talking about products, the concept is quite simple. So in order to make the system degrade the target protein, we first need to mark it with ubiquitin, which is delivered by another protein, which is called E3 ligase. Uh, and the, the core challenge is how we uh, can make this protein-protein uh, complex of our target protein in E3 ligase. So the idea is that if we know a ligand that binds to our target protein. And if we know a ligand that strongly interacts with E3 ligase, we can try to come up with a linker that would connect these two ligands, uh, creating uh, a new, much larger uh, bifunctional molecule, which is actually called protax. And in this case, of course, designing the linker between these known ligands is the way how we design new chemical matter in this case. And of course, uh, we should emphasize that in all these cases, we um, are talking about structure-based drug design when we already uh, know something about our target structure. And of course, in this case, leveraging as much information available as possible is beneficial way. And especially in all these cases, since we are starting with some existing uh, molecular fragments that we already are aware of, uh, we can also leverage the information about interactions between these fragments and our target protein structure, if it's available, of course. And there are some examples how it can be done. For example, uh, in PROTAC, we can first consider experimentally observed uh, protein ligand complexes of our target protein with its ligand and of E3 ligase with the corresponding ligand that binds to this E3 ligase. And then we can um, use some computational methods to dock these proteins with ligands bound to them together, for example, using Rosetta. Um, and then since we docked this, um, these proteins to each other, we can consider uh, ligands with their mutual orientations and 3D positions uh, to design a linker that would stabilize this uh, ternary complex. Another more uh, maybe classical example um, is uh, leveraging protein fragment interactions uh, in the design of the anti-cancer drug venetoclax, which is currently approved and uh, is used in patients with uh, leukemia. So here the pipeline is that we start with two compounds that are uh, bound to the target protein, and these um, compounds bound to this target protein are uh, absorbed with NMR uh, approach. And then we can basically use this 3D information and the way how these compounds interact with the protein in order to design the linker between these compounds and further also um, alter some parts of it and also grow this molecule resulting eventually in uh, venetoclax. And finally, I should also mention our uh, recent work that we've done in our group. So here we uh, developed um, fragment screening pipeline, which is based on uh, protein surface representations. So here we created the database of uh, fragment uh, pocket pairs that we extracted from PDB bind. And uh, we represent pockets with this uh, point cloud representations with learned embeddings for each point on the surface. And the idea here is that we can actually, if we have a new protein pocket 
that we want to find the fragment that binds to it, we can go to this database and compare representations of our target protein surface and um, pocket surfaces that are stored in this database. And then we can also perform alignment in 3D and scoring uh, and eventually get the list of uh, fragments that are already oriented in 3D and pre-docked to our target protein pocket. And therefore, in this case, we also have a, um, the next question is how to create the molecule out of this uh, predefined and pre-located uh, uh, fragments. Okay, so uh, uh, keeping in mind all these examples and strategies that we've just discussed, uh, we can uh, formulate requirements for the method that we want to develop to link our fragments together. So first of all, we uh, consider fragments that are placed in 3D space, which means that we have coordinates of every atom in these fragments. Uh, and we want to design the linker that would uh, connect these fragments together in a single molecule, but we uh, don't expect to have any information on the linker size in the beginning. We also don't know uh, which atoms should be connected in the fragments exactly. So we don't know this anchor points. Um, besides, we can uh, we we don't want to be limited by the number of fragments that we can connect at the same time. So it can be most commonly, of course, a pair of fragments, but in principle, we would like also to be able to connect three and more fragments simultaneously. And finally, if we are talking about structure-based drug design, it's also very important that the linker that we generate is consistent with the surrounding protein pocket. And the simplest thing that we want uh, to require from our method is that it produces linker, uh, linkers that, are, uh, that don't have any clashes with the surrounding uh, protein atoms. Uh, and there have been proposed uh, several machine learning based methods for solving this task. But as we will see uh, in a bit, none of them actually uh, satisfy all the formulated requirements. And the first method that we can uh, talk about is Sintalinker, which is a transformer-based uh, model that operates on symbolic string representations of molecules, which are called smiles. So the idea is that this model takes um, smiles representation of the fragments as input. Also, it requires to specify the number of covalent bonds that should be uh, included in the generated linker. And also uh, anchor atoms are marked with specific symbols in the smiles notation as it's shown here. Uh, and yeah, so this model uh, generates the linker also in smiles notation. So it doesn't really operate on any 3D information and it's just, yeah, basically formulas of molecules there. Um, the next method, which is called the linker uh, was also recently proposed. So this is a graph variational after encoder that operates on 2D molecular graphs and um, iteratively uh, generates atoms and covalent bonds between uh, inputs a pair of fragments. Um, even though it uh, sort of takes into account geometric information, this information is quite limited. And it actually consists of just two scalar numbers corresponding to the distance between input fragments and the angle between these fragments. Uh, and finally, uh, this summer, there was another method that was proposed, uh, and it's actually quite si similar to the linker. It's called 3D linker, and it's also a variation after encoder that operates on graphs. But uh, the two main differences that were uh, introduced in this paper are first that um, anchor atoms are predicted by a separate uh, pre-trained neural network. And secondly, this method uh, operates on 3D graphs using equivariant um, vector neuron MLPs that yeah, basically help the model to take into account all the symmetries of the space. However, uh, what the linker and 3D linker uh, are designed to connect uh, one anchor atom with the second anchor atom iteratively in an after aggressive manner when it just uh, generates a single atom at every time step and then it connects this atom with the existing atoms in the system. So it means that basically it's very hard to adjust these after aggressive methods to um, connect uh, multiple fragments simultaneously because it's very hard to make them take into account all the context at the same time. Um, moreover, none of these methods uh, was tested in other 
uh, scenarios, for example, uh, conditioned on the protein pockets. So in order to develop uh, a new, more flexible method that uh, could be naturally applied in these different scenarios that we discussed, uh, we consider diffusion models that have demonstrated outstanding performance in uh, various domains such as image, text, video um, generation. For example, in this slide, you can see the screenshot from OpenAI model that gets uh, some image description as input and uh, generates uh, new images that correspond to this description. So there are many more, uh, even newer models that do similar things and other very uh, exciting things. Um, and they are becoming extremely popular um, this year. So the general idea of the diffusion model uh, is that, um, yes, Prudencio, do you have a question? Yeah, so just uh, there was a question by Elena in the chat. Why uh, do, do you generate only one linker? Sorry, what's the question? So why generate only one linker when you have the, the existing fragment? So I, I guess the question is whether sh uh, the generation is only of only one link linker or just a distribution of, 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 of linkers. Um, so, um, so at every... Uh, let's say at every run of our model, we generate a single linker, but every time they are, of course, new since, yeah, we just randomly sample from uh, distribution. But maybe uh, the question can be also about if the linker that we generate should be just a single connected component or there can be several disconnected parts. If that's the question, then our model actually is not limited to generate just single connected linker, and it can connect multiple fragments in uh, several ways. For example, in this, um, yeah, on this image, uh, the example here is just a single linker that connects three parts, but uh, it is also possible that there would be two disconnected uh, linkers. One, let's say, connecting these two nitrogens and the other one goes from, I don't know, from here, let's say, if it makes sense chemically, <laughs> um, to, to the, the other fragment. So it's also possible. Okay, so I think I will keep talking about diffusion models then. Um, so yeah, the main idea of the diffusion model is that, um, yeah, we have two processes. The first process is a forward diffusion process that maps our data point, which is in our, in this case, it's a image of cat to uh, uh, noise. And the other way around, the denoising process is intended to take the noise as input and transform it into something that makes sense in terms of our training data set. In this case, some image of the cat. Um, to be more specific, we can take a look at, let's say we have a training set of cat images as here, and this distribution is very complicated. So the idea of a forward diffusion process is that it takes um, the data point sampled or taken from this complicated distribution and maps it to um, a point in a very simple prior distribution, which is usually a standard Gaussian distribution. And in this case, uh, Reverse denoising process is intended to learn the trajectory that brings the point from complicated distribution to prior Gaussian, and then we can try to reverse this trajectory and generate uh, new um, new images, for example, in this case. All right, so now let's replace uh, cat images with molecules. And in principle, conceptually, uh, the idea is all the same. So our data points are molecules that are denoted by in the beginning, they are denoted by uh, letter X. And uh, a diffusion process iteratively adds some noise to our molecules. And after uh, big T time steps, we have some noise instead of the molecule. So it's important to uh, mention how we represent our molecules. And uh, yeah, so basically we have two different variables. Uh, coordinates of all atoms, which is denoted by XR, and every atom has um, atom type, which is represented by one hot encoded vector. So these are 
uh, XH our let's say node features or atom features and these two variables for simplicity are considered always together and uh, we omit this um, indices and just yeah represent it as a letter X and if we are talking about an intermediate states uh, we will use the letter Z in this case okay so now let's take a look what happens uh, at some intermediate step t minus one and how we go to the next step uh, to get zt. So here it's the uh, transition distribution from zt to zt minus one, um, which is actually, uh, yes, that's correct. So we, we uh, start at zt minus one and we want to get zt. And as you can see here, so this is a isotropic Gaussian distribution where the mean depends on our uh, data on our current uh, data point states at t minus one, but it's scaled by some parameter alpha uh, t bar. And also we have um, variance, which is also defined by some hyperparameter a sigma t bar. And we will discuss um, what these two parameters mean a bit later. But essentially this is just as a tropic Gaussian that is centered somewhere close to the current state of our data point. Now we also take an assumption that our diffusion process is Markovian, which means that the joint distribution of all intermediate steps can be written down as a uh, simple product of these transition kernels. Uh, and yeah, since we have this Markovian assumption and also uh, Gaussian distributions in the beginning, we actually can write down the conditional distribution of any intermediate steps at T given our input data point X. And as you can see here, it's also um, isotropic Gaussian, which is centered somewhere at the initial data point, but scaled by um, parameter alpha T and with uh, variance sigma T. And actually here, that's these are the formulas for uh, connection between this uh, alpha T bar and alpha T and sigma T bar and sigma T. But uh, for us, it may be, it's easier to take a look at this last formula when we try to define the distribution of the intermediate data step given our initial data point X. And here we can actually see that what we are doing here, we just multiply our initial signal by some coefficient. And it means that the smaller coefficient, the less signal we retain in our current state. And at the same time, the higher variance, the more noise we add to our data. So, uh, if we look at the plots, there are, can be different uh, noise uh, schedule parameters, uh, how we define this alpha t over different time steps. But in our case, we consider uh, quadratic dependency on the time step. And for example, here it means that at the zeroth time step, when our signal is not distorted, we have alpha t equal one, which means that our mean is right at the data point and sigma equals zero, which means that we don't have any noise. And then over these uh, time steps, we uh, reduce the alpha t parameter, retaining less and less signal every time and increasing noise parameter. Okay, so that was um, the forward diffusion process. Now let's take a look what happens when we reverse this process. And these are the formulas that we discussed in the previous slide. So. Uh, again, since uh, this Markman assumptions and the Ga Gaussian uh, distributions, we can actually uh, analytically derive the formulas for transition kernels of the true denoising process when we want to get the data state at t minus one step given zt. But of course, here we should take into account also our ultimate uh, goal, our initial data point x, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to, um, you know, get these formulas. Uh, because it's like um, we need to have something in the end because we want to restore the trajectory. Uh, and this is also Gaussian, but with a bit uh, more complicated parameters that are although still derived analytically. But of course, uh, if we remember the initial uh, idea and purpose of, of, of this model is that we basically have our prior distribution, which is very simple and we can easily sample from this prior distribution, but then we want to map this uh, sampled noise to something meaningful. And we actually don't know exactly uh, the terminal step. So we don't, uh, in reality, we don't have information about this data point X. And that's why we introduce uh, a generative denoising process, 
which is very similar to trudinizing process, but the difference is that instead of having you know, determined data point X, we try to approximate it somehow. And yeah, for this, we use a neural network that learns to predict X hat, which is an approximation of our terminal point X. But in fact, if we uh, look at this formula and use the reparameterization trick, then we will be able to derive the dependency between our data point and any intermediate steps at T that we have. So essentially this formula says that if we have some, if we know uh, intermediate steps at T, then X can be uh, derived by subtracting some noise from our intermediate step. And in fact, it means that we can predict directly noise instead of data point X. And it has been shown to empirically to be more stable to predict the noise instead of the data point itself. So in our case, we also uh, learn to predict the noise that should be subtracted from the intermediate data point to get the final data point X hat. Yes, and uh, of course, in this case, in general, uh, when we are training this model, we want to optimize the likelihood of our model uh, for, you know, to model the distribution of our data that we train it on. And uh, in this papers, it was also shown that actually optimize the, optimizing the model for just this mean squared error between the real noise that should be subtracted and the noise predicted by neural network uh, actually uh, allows us to eventually optimize the variational lower bound. And uh, when operating on geometric objects, it's also very important to take into account uh, different symmetries uh, of the space and design functions that uh, respect the symmetries. So for example, if we transform the input uh, of some function, we want um, the output the two of this function to change accordingly the transformation of the input as it's shown in this image. So uh, such functions that actually follow this requirement, they are called equivalent with respect to uh, specific transformations. Uh, more formally, we can write it down in terms of uh, groups and uh, group representations as, as it's shown here. But in our particular case, we are especially interested in Euclidean group that includes uh, translations, rotations, and reflections of our 3D objects, of our molecules. And besides, we also, of course, want our operations to be permutation equivalent because uh, we operate on, on graphs where we have some order of nodes and we don't want to depend on this ordering. Um, so since we define uh, equivalent function in this way, it's actually also very easy to define equivalent conditional uh, distributions. So we say that distribution P of X given Y is equivalent with respect to some transformation if, uh, if the probability of transformed X given uh, consistently transformed Y is the same as probability of X given Y. So in principle, it makes sense. Uh, if we are talking about molecules, it means that, let's say, the likelihood of seeing a molecule at some particular um, point in the space should be the same as the probability or the likelihood of seeing this the same molecule, but let's say shifted for some uh, along some axis or rotated, let's say. So that's what this uh, requirement means. Uh, and okay, so we briefly discussed the diffusion models and its application to molecules. We also uh, looked at uh, equivalence of conditional distributions. Now we can combine these things and formulate our uh, um, molecular linker design problem in terms of this, uh, yeah, diffusion models and equivalent distributions. So uh, in our case, we have uh, fragments uh, that are placed in a space, and we want to uh, sample and denoise the linker between these atoms. So first of all, uh, instead of having just uh, our data point X that we, you know, sampled from the prior distribution as Z T B can then iteratively denoised resulting in X. Now we have uh, our data point X, which is a linker, which is a modifiable part, and fixed context U, which in the simplest case corresponds to uh, input fragments, but also it can be, for example, uh, a system of protein atoms 
that belong to the protein pocket where these fragments are bound to. And uh, in the same way, when we are talking about um, about intermediate states of our data point ZT, so now we consider ZT with the same context U, which is always unchanged as shown in this in this image. And now we can also modify our uh, generative uh, transition kernels. So instead of having P Z T minus one given Z T, we have similar but also conditioned on our context U. Um, and if we write it down in terms of uh, Q, then this context actually goes to our um, our approximation of X. So our neural network that operates on the intermediate state uh, and tries to predict the noise that should be subtracted to get X hat, it also operates on the context U. So we will take a look at it uh, more precisely in the next slide. Uh, but okay, now we have these uh, fragments that are actually uh, 3D objects, and we want our uh, distributions to be conditioned on these 3D objects, and we want our model to be actually E3 equivalent. So it turns out that uh, there are two requirements for our model to be equivalent to rotations and reflections, and we will discuss translations uh, separately. So first of all, if we look here, we we can see that uh, we need to sample our initial um, noise for linker uh, in some point in the space. And it makes sense that this point depends on our context, right? So for example, we can try to sample in the center of mass of the input fragments. So uh, uh, generally speaking, we can say that our prior distribution is Gaussian that is centered at uh, f of u, where u is context, and f is some function that basically takes the context as input and outputs the just a single point where we should sample our noise. Uh, and the so this is uh, the thing that we can actually design. And the second uh, function that we also design is our neural network that predicts the noise that should be subtracted during the diffusion. Uh, sorry, during the denoising process. So it turns out that actually, if our F is uh, O3 equivalent and our neural network is also equivalent to joint O3 transformations of the context and the uh, input intermediate steps at T, uh, then our uh, probabilistic model is also equivalent in the sense that if we rotate our context, which is fragments, and also the linker, then the probability of this doesn't change. Um, yes, okay, so now let's talk about the, uh, yes, uh, Prudencio, you have a question. Yes, um, there's a few questions in the chat that I haven't seen, I haven't seen. so uh, mm -hmm. one question by Yen, uh, how do you diffuse your node feature atom type or the model only diffuse the 3D coordinates? Yes, um, thank you for this question. Um, if we go back here, no, I think it's better to go back here. Yeah, so as I said here, we have, um, so we represent our molecule as uh, atom coordinates and atom types. So basically we also diffuse everything together. Uh, so we sample random coordinates according to the Gaussian distribution, and we also sample random atom types. And uh, for sampling, uh, and denoising atom types, we have the, uh, we apply the same trick uh, as was applied in equivalent diffusion models. So, yeah, since atom types are discrete values, we need to leave them to the continuous domain. So we basically represent them as um, one hot encoded uh, atom types. So these are just vectors with one, one, and the rest of zeros, and then we treat them as continuous, independent continuous variables. And then once we, uh, so we denoise these values, and in the end, we take argmax, and yeah, this is our atom type. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so one other question by Marius is, can fragment interface, uh, meaning the anchors, only be uh, atom or it can be part of ring? Uh, I'm not sure if the question is clear for you, but otherwise maybe Marius, you can clarify it yourself. Yeah, uh, I think for me, it's not really clear. Maybe if Marius could elaborate on it.
Um, yeah, maybe he will elaborate later on in the chat and then I will ask again. So related to the answer you uh, you gave um, previously, um, Nick was asking, uh, I see how that works for replacing part of the molecule, but how does it work for the nosine to something that doesn't exist before? Meaning the atom type are not given. Um, yeah, so uh, we need to uh, predefine atom types in the beginning. So yeah, of course, if we don't have uh, some specific atom in our training set, then we won't be able to generate molecule that has this atom. Okay, cool. One question by uh, Abrik, uh, Sil. This is just... Uh, it's just getting fragment based on the distribution on, of a fragment. How many diverse structures you get? Do you get long alkyl chain as linkers? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so probably it will be better to talk about it when we will be discussing results because there are also metrics uh, that show how diverse the generated linkers and also some examples. Maybe it will be uh, also have helpful. But otherwise, if uh, if it won't answer your question, we can discuss it afterwards as well. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So then I'm continuing. Yeah, so we stopped here. And uh, here I wanted to briefly uh, comment on the neural network that we use, uh, which is basically a coherent graph neural network, the same as was used in uh, equivalent diffusion models for molecule generation. So in our case, um, we have actually two parts of our system. The context, which is unchanged, and uh, it's represented in red here and intermediate step uh, state of our data uh, ZT, which is a uh, linker partially denoised. So in order to predict the noise that we want to subtract from this uh, partially denoised linker, we consider uh, all atoms from the fragments and from the linker as uh, nodes of a single fully connected graph. And each node here has uh, coordinates vector and feature vector, which is atom types. And we also compute the distances between all pairs of nodes. And then according to this message passing uh, mechanism, we first compute uh, messages that should be sent between, uh, between all pairs of nodes as functions that depends on the feature vectors of these nodes plus uh, square distance between these nodes. Um, and also, um, yeah, actually, I think uh, it's already relevant because it stands for attention uh, coefficients that uh, could be uh, computed, but we don't do this here. So yeah, um, basically, uh, these are just messages that depend on feature vectors and distances between nodes. And then we have updates for uh, node feature vectors, which are aggregations of these messages that we computed here, and also weights of these messages that are additionally computed by another trainable element here. Um, and besides, we also update the coordinates of all nodes. Uh, but uh, here I should mention that um, we, yeah, we don't update coordinates of all nodes, we update only coordinates of the linker, because the idea is still the same that, yeah, we want the linker to be changed, but um, our context is actually fixed and known. So we don't really want to alter the coordinates of atoms that belong to the context because it doesn't make sense. So here, the only difference from the uh, vanilla uh, equivalent graph neural network is that we don't update all coordinates in our graph, but only the coordinates that belong to linker atoms. And the final thing that we didn't discuss yet is the way how we uh, predict the number of atoms in our model, uh, sorry, in the linker that should be uh, designed. And here we pre-train the uh, separate graph neural network that operates on input fragments uh, and predicts the probabilities. So it basically solves the classification problem where labels are 
numbers numbers of atoms in linkers from the training set. Um, and uh, the idea here is that basically we believe that since we take uh, these uh, 3D orientations and positions of input fragments, um, probably this information is roughly enough to have an idea about the number of atoms that should be sampled for the linker. Um, and since we pretend such a model and the generation step, we um, predict probabilities for the different numbers of atoms in the linker. And then we sample from these um, categorical distributions with these probabilities that we predicted at GNN. And th that's how we get the number of atoms in the linker. And then we uh, perform the denoising process with the pre-trained diffusion model. Um, and uh, so later uh, in the next slides, we are going to discuss the results. But here I would briefly uh, sum up on the modalities that can be you know, used for this task and for our model specifically. So regarding linker size, uh, we can sample uh, the number of linker uh, number of atoms in the linker from pre-trained graph neural network, but also, of course, it can be specified by the user, and in many cases, probably it's also a possible option. Uh, and some of our experiments are also done uh, with the assumption that the number of uh, atoms is known, and actually it corresponds to the ground truth. Uh, then we also can consider different context U. So before we were talking about uh, considering fragments, as input fragments as the context, but of course we can also add uh, more atoms, for example, from the protein pocket and consider fragments plus pocket as our context U. And finally, regarding the uh, function F, which determines where we initially sample uh, linker atoms, there are also two options. In case when we, in the most general case, when we don't know, um, we don't know what atoms should be connected in the fragment, we can sample around center of mass of the full context or on the fragments, for example. But also if we have an information about anchors, we can sample in the center of mass of anchors, which makes our initial sampling even a bit more precise. Okay, talking about results, first of all, we compared our method with uh, the linker and 3D linker in two, let's say, standard data sets that were used by these uh, methods previously. These are Zinc and CASF. In both cases, the, the task was to connect pairs of fragments. And we, in our case, we uh, tested four different models with different modalities. For example, this is uh, diff linker that predicts uh, Sorry, this diff-linker operates on the, so here the number of atoms is taken from the test set as well as in these methods, uh, and it doesn't know about anchors. So this model knows about anchors, and in these two models we additionally sample the linker size. And uh, to assess the performance of our models, we estimated drug likeness of the generated molecules, synthetic accessibility, and number of rings in the generated linkers. So these three metrics uh, are uh, supposed to give a more idea in terms of applicability of this uh, method in drug design uh, tasks. And besides, yes, Prudencio? Sorry, Prudencio, did you raise your hand? Yes, yes, sorry, I was, I was still on mute. Um, ah. So one, one question by, by Lewis. Um, how do you ensure that the final 3D graph have reasonable geometry with respect to the atom type, atom bone, and torsion type? Um, so this is a good question. Uh, actually, it's very uh, relevant question to our method because yeah, we operate on row 3D point clouds, right? And we don't even um, add any, uh, let's say constraints, uh, physically or chemically motivated constraints in our generative process, which is actually different from what is done in the linker and 3D linker, because they, for example, uh, when they place new atom and connect it with a covalent bond, they also employ uh, valency constraints in order to, you know, uh, be able to generate only uh, valid uh, covalent bonds. So in our case, we don't do anything like this. Um, so this is first the potential uh, direction for improvement, but on the other hand, it's very nice to see that actually 
our molecules are still very valid. If you look at this metric validity, which is, uh, so it checks two things. First, it checks that all the fragments are included in the final uh, connected component of the molecule. And uh, after that, it also tries to sanitize, which is very yeah common uh, approach to check validity. It also uh, checks the valency rules and all these things. Uh, and yeah, here we can say that, of course, our method uh, is not as good as the linker and 3D linker, but I would say that this performance is quite impressive given that we don't um, include any, you know, uh, yeah, any um, artificial constraints, let's say artificial, the ones that we uh, provide themselves, uh, ourselves, and we only rely on our model to learn from the raw data, and it does. Sorry, I think it was quite long answer. <laughs> I think it's fine. Um, so one question from Ella, is QD a good metric for prototype generation, for, for linker generation here? Um, yeah, this is also a good question. Uh, I think that, no, to be honest, I can't answer really because I don't have too much experience with product. Um, but uh, there, our motivation was to include as many potentially relevant metrics as possible. And for sure, I think that QED and uh, synthetic accessibility are the ones that uh, give some idea about the yeah, quality of molecules that, that are generated. Okay, perfect. Um, there's a few more questions that might require some discussion. We can leave them uh, to the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so I will try to speed up. Uh, so in, yeah, in this table, uh, there are results of diff linker on zinc and cast data sets that yeah, consist of uh, pairs of fragments. And here the nice things is that if we look at uniqueness and novelty, we can say that yeah, sampling the size uh, expectedly increases these numbers quite a lot, but also it, yeah, it's like another option to, you know, increase the diversity of the generated molecules, of course. Um, all right, yeah. And also uh, here, maybe I can say that uh, for zinc, we generated uh, 3D conformers ourselves using uh, force field optimization and CASF uh, consists of experimentally observed uh, small molecules. So it's more realistic, but also maybe more noisy. So the numbers here are in principle are a bit lower. And uh, moving forward, so uh, to test, you know, uh, more applications of the model, we created a new data set uh, based on GeomDrax data set. So here we split uh, molecules in more than two fragments and sometimes even more than one linker connecting these fragments. Um, and yeah, and here we also measured the same metrics as before, but to demonstrate um, how 3D linker works uh, on this data set, we try to adjust it by, you know, se sequentially connecting pairs of fragments that are given, that are, you know, taken from this triplets of fragments randomly. And basically, yeah, we can say that uh, 3D linker uh, underperforms significantly in this task, uh, while the li uh, diff linker still uh, uh, demonstrates very decent results in this metrics. And uh, addressing one of questions that were asked, these are examples of linkers that were generated for input fragments. So here, for example, these are initial fragments, and this is the ground truth linker, which is not that complicated, let's say. Um, and yeah, these are different linkers that were generated. So you can see that the linker is uh, able to uh, produce some non-trivial results, including some different rings and ring systems as well as here, so here it can, yeah, uh, it can generate uh, rings on different sides and also, yeah, more simple linkers here. And actually this is the example when uh, two disconnected linkers are uh, generated. And finally, talking about uh, pocket condition generation. So here we, uh, yeah, created like the third uh, data set that we use in this, um, uh, in this work. So this one was taken from binding mod the database that accumulates protein ligand interactions experimentally observed and deposited in PDB. Uh, and here we also generated um, fragments, but already, you know, having the molecule
molecule that is bound to the protein pocket. We took this molecule, generated fragments, removed linker, and then considered fragments plus protein pocket as input to our model. And we actually trained three different models that operate on different, you know, amount of information about the protein pocket. So we first have uh, the linker that is trained to generate linkers between fragments without any information uh, about the surrounding protein pocket. Then we have the linker uh, that uh, operates on pocket backbone atoms and on full atomic representation of the pocket. And then we sampled linkers on the test set and uh, computed the distribution of clashes um, between generated linkers and uh, protein pocket atoms. And expectedly, but also nice to check that, yeah, if we, uh, if we generate linkers conditioned on the full atomic representation of the protein pocket, then distribution of clashes is very close to the yeah, distribution of clashes even in the reference data. And the less information about the protein we include in our experiments, the more clashes we get. And finally, uh, also very important to mention that, yeah, one of the main drawbacks of diffusion models is that uh, sampling is basically a bottleneck because usually you should sample quite a lot of time steps and it can be parallelized efficiently. But here, uh, yeah, following the previous uh, papers on diffusion models in computer vision, we decided to see how performance behaves if we reduce the number of sampling steps um, uh, while you know having always the same model trained on some specific big T, which is here 500 steps. Uh, and we can say that if we uh, reduce the number of sampling steps uh, 10 times, so having just 50 sampling steps instead of 500, the uh, the key performance metrics, they don't really degrade significantly, which is also nice. And it uh, makes our model even you know, faster than it actually expected to be since it's diffusion model. Okay, to sum up, uh, I was just talking about diffLinker, which is uh, E3 equivalent uh, diffusion model that generates linkers between 3D fragments of the molecule. And the main advantages of our model is that it can connect uh, any number of fragments simultaneously. It also can be connect, uh, conditioned on additional contacts such as protein pockets, atoms, and uh, as well as uh, recent previous methods, it doesn't require any information on attachment atoms and linker size. And I would like to thank our wonderful collaborators, uh, Hannes Stark, Clement Vignac, Victor Garcia Satoris, Pascal Frossard, Max Welling and my uh, thesis advisors, Michael Bronstein and Bruno Correa. Uh, feel free to uh, write us uh, in email and check our GitHub and Hugging Face with demonstrations for the Flinker. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much for the for the great talk, uh, Ilya. Um, so there's a few more questions in the chat. Um, so I start with the last one and go up. Uh, could this uh, linker task be tackled by GFNet? Uh, can this linker task be tackled by GFNet? Oh, that's a interesting question. Um, in principle, I guess so. So to be honest, I'm not. I'm not too familiar with GFNet. I mean, I just read a few blocks on it basically but i guess so yeah it, it is possible probably with some uh, you know architecture ad adjustments and yeah i would guess that it's possible okay perfect um have you tested the linkers with protas which uh which is a great subset to validate and would make big impacts. Uh, Abhik, uh, do you mind asking the question yourself? I'm not sure it's clear. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe I think I understood the question. So is it 
The question about just testing on some product examples to see how it generates the linkers between the ligands in product cases. Um, so if it's the question, then actually um, we did a very, uh, yeah, very quick, you know, check with some random product that I uh, that I took from this uh, recent review on uh, products and uh, molecular glues. So these are examples, and actually here they don't really look uh, too good. I mean, in terms of chemistry, uh, maybe some of them are better. Uh, but also important thing is that you know uh, products are usually much bigger, and the linker size that is required for you know linking two ligands that bind to different proteins is a bit bigger than the one that we use in training. So I think it's uh, interesting to see how the linker performs in product cases. But just the one thing that we should keep in mind is that there should be enough training examples that um, you know that are similar to products, or at least they have many atoms removed and to be generated. Um, one question by Gustavo: Do the pocket resolution include only 3D position? Can they? Um and just atom type and possible interaction as well. For example, can this uh, can the possibility of a linker making an H bond to the protein be taken into account, like kind of a 3D pharmacophore uh, thing? Um, so do I understand correctly that the question is if it's possible to in, uh, extend the set of uh, like variables that are denoised and sampled? In, no, I think it's more on the on the condition uh, um, to the generation the, related to the pocket. Is it possible to include condition related to um, interaction between the pocket and the linker? Like what will be generated? We want what will be generated to make a hydrogen bond somewhere in the in the pocket, for example. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I still I'm not sure if I understand what exactly. Uh, we can include. Could you please repeat? Um, maybe Gustavo, do you want to mind explain yourself? Yeah, uh, I can. I can do that. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Right. Uh, well, first, uh, thank you for this uh, for the talk. It's really interesting. Uh, Ilya, uh, what I, what I'm trying to know is if you can, basically, how are the restrictions on the pocket included? Are, do they only have like the 3D information that gives limits to the to the positions of the atoms in the linker, or uh, can you also add atomic uh, uh, information on the protein so that, for example, if the protein has uh, a nitrogen in a certain position, then the linker maybe will be have a higher probability of having. Uh, an OH pointing to that high nitrogen there when yeah. you generate the link linker. You see, uh, see what I mean? Does it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, in case of protein, we just have additional nodes with all the same things here in this graph. So these nodes belong to protein pocket, and they also have atom types and coordinates. So yeah, it doesn't change anyhow. We just have additional flag that says that this is um, like protein atoms and these are for example uh, fragment atoms and these are linker atoms so we kind of you know di di distinguish between uh, nodes based on this flux that we have here in feature vectors but besides that when we include protein pocket we also consider it as a you know point cloud of protein atoms with their atom types and we connect them in this, the same graph Thank you. Yeah, maybe one uh, detail is that when we include pocket information, we uh, don't use a fully connected graph anymore, but we then connect um, nodes within some distance. I think it's uh, five or six angstrom, because otherwise we wouldn't fit in memory and yeah, a lot of computations if we have fully connected graph with uh, over 100 nodes. That, that makes sense, thanks. Yeah. Um, I have a question myself, uh, Ilya. So, yeah. 
when you were doing the the, the pocket generation, you were considering the number of clash uh, as a as a metric, and I'm wondering if that's actually a good metric. Uh, why not use, for example, the MS, uh, the MSD of non-binders uh, to to non-binders as as a metric or a likelihood compared to the to the set uh, distribution it, it, it established by non-binder binder as a metric. Yeah, this is a uh, good suggestion. Probably we should have used more um, metrics to characterize how well uh, designed linkers and designed molecules interact with the protein. Yeah, so I think this is, uh, yeah, we, we probably need to include it and to, you know, perform maybe a bit deeper research on it. Because here, the, the maybe the our initial idea was to show that our method is very easily can be you know easily ad adjusted to this a bit different task when we have additional context besides fragments and the main purpose of sorry yeah main purpose of this plot is basically to show that yeah look um yeah we you know include additional information and our model is able to um, take this into account and respect this you know constraints that are imposed by this additional data but yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's also interesting to see how well it predicts, yeah, how well it generates molecules that really interact and yeah, with the protein. Okay. Um, I think one question that I forgot to ask is, um, given, is it correct that for a given linker size, the algorithm will more likely connect the fragment with the linker at the most extreme distance of the linker? So if you include the um, the linker size, meaning the the linker generator will be connecting frag, um, atoms that are far, far in the in the in the link uh, in the fragment. Um, yeah. So uh, the question is, if we uh, input a very big number of atoms in in the linker, is it correct that then uh, more far like pair of fragments of atoms will be connected yeah uh or the, or the algorithm we find I, like i can probably explain this sorry i i wasn't very good first of all thanks a lot i think it was a super interesting presentation here this is nick um so assume you say you estimate your number of of linker atoms that you have at the moment right this is what you mm -hmm. showed and i think it's a good idea but assume that a user would say that i i can fit in let's say you know 12 atoms instead of just six because i know mm -hmm. there is a site which couldn't also be explored by the linker at the same time mm -hmm. would then if you think about a two ring system which is connected like a site with like a fused system like kinoline or something like that, yeah would you also do one four connections instead of like a, a one seven connection would be essentially go over the length of the of the graph is there is that something you see and when i look at your current upper part here it seems like it's a little bit the case um it seems um, to be always you go with the like the the longest distance to really cover the the biggest distance with this the fewest number of atoms this is what it looks a little bit like um so this is a good uh observation actually no uh, to be honest I, I don't think that we notice something like this Okay. But in principle, what we, yeah, we just, you know, visually when we inspected the results, we just saw that, yeah, you know, the more atoms you introduce in the system, the more complicated probably the output becomes. Like here, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So number of atoms here is, is, is larger than here, and it just puts it in some rings, in some ring systems. Um, but yeah. Uh, I, I can say that we really noticed some specific behavior. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. Hmm. Any more questions? Yeah, I have one. Um, thank you for the great talk. So I was wondering, do you consider such the uh, free energy estimation or the stability of the 3D conformation? Because I was, I was thinking maybe the molecule may um, alter its structure maybe very slightly, but, but uh, it may change your assumption about fixed context so that uh, those fragments may no longer fit into the protein, protein binding pockets. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, so we don't really do anything like this. We don't do relaxation of the final molecule, which is actually maybe a good idea. And 
yeah, it, it is worth just seeing how it looks and what happens, let's say, if we also, you know, have um, pocket conditioning. Yeah. Yeah, I think the problem is that if you have a very long linker, those proportionally longer than the fragment, then maybe the linker can somehow interact with the uh, fragment uh, in unconstrained situations and the compound is no longer very uh, structural. Yeah, yeah, definitely.